Hello and welcome to uh, testing ECMAScript modules in Node.js with me, David Mark Clements. Uh, in the bottom bottom right, um, mistakes are staying in by the way, uh, in the bottom right of the slide, um, there's a URL. Um, you can use that short URL if you don't have access to the link through some chat mechanism or, or otherwise. Um, to load these slides and follow along if you so choose. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about ECMAScript modules and actually testing uh, ECMAScript modules, which are relatively new. Well, they're not that new, but they're relatively new in Node. Speaking of Node, um, Node now has two module systems. Um, The original is uh, referred to as CommonJS. Uh, it's a slight misnomer. The, uh, at the time when Node was going through a rapid phase uh, of innovation and, and, and coming together, uh, it was, uh, there was no module specification for JavaScript. Um, ECMAScript, by the way, is the official name of JavaScript, if you didn't know that. Um, but there were some experimental uh, uh, specifications for something that was broadly referred to as common JS. Um, require JS in the browser was 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 related to that. Um, where, but whereas require JS, uh, the front end require JS uh, worked asynchronously, um, the common JS implementation that uh, that Node uh, was inspired by, let's say, uh, is synchronous. So when a dependency loads a dependency, um, uh, say require foo, um, the file is synchronously loaded uh, from the file system. And what that means is that execution blocks until that file is loaded and then evaluated, and then whatever that file exports uh, on the module.exports object is returned from the require function. Um, the object that gets returned is mutable because it's really just uh, evaluating a, a file, um, wrapping a, an in, a function wrapper around it, and then um, uh, seeing what that function wrapper does to the module exports object. So it's, there's a mani there's, you know, manipulating an object essentially, uh, and then returns that, that result. Um, uh, the, if a file has already been loaded, uh, then the cache is used. So it's not going to reload files that represent a dependency over and over again. They come from uh, the require cache object. Um, so CommonJS is the original uh, module system uh, of Node, and it can only load other CommonJS modules at initialization time. Um, you can use the uh, dynamic import function to asynchronously load uh, um, an ESM module from a CEGS module, but only after initialization. So it can't be part of that initial uh, uh, dependency tree. It has to be loaded later and then, and then used. Um, ECMAScript modules um, are a, a, an official specification for the module system in Node, uh, in in Node or in the browser, um, and I think I don't think it's unfair to say that that the, the specification was primarily browser focused, um, and what's intended for is kind of a replacement or um, let's say an analog of the script tag in the browser. If you think of a script tag, it gets it's HTML that gets passed out, and then whatever. Uh, source you specify is then loaded by the browser, and the browser can choose uh, to a certain extent how it wants to do that. Um, uh, the ECMAScript module's uh, import syntax um, is supposed to be uh, and is statically analyzable in a similar way to script tags in the browser. Let's um, make sure that we differentiate here because if you use TypeScript or if you use Babel, you might think that you already um, use ESM modules um, because an, an ESM module um, essentially sort of looks like this. 
And uh, you do see that uh, in, in code all around the place. Uh, but it's not the same as native ESM modules. I refer to these, as do some others, uh, as, as faux ESM. Because uh, if we just focus on Node for a second, uh, if you're using a TypeScript or, or Babel, um, that syntax is essentially being uh, transpiled or compiled in the case of TypeScript, I suppose, um, down to common JS syntax. So when you're using faux ESM, you're really using common JS for the most part. Uh, I'm sure things will evolve slowly over time. Um, but when I'm talking about ECMAScript modules here, I'm talking about the natively implemented specification um, that is present in some browsers. I think Chrome has support, uh, probably some others as well. Uh, not paid too much attention. Um, but in Node, they are uh, in version 12 and version 14 and version 16. Um, something uh, that is a very large differentiation between common JS modules and native ECMAScript modules is that ESM loads asynchronously. So uh, the file, for instance, could be loaded asynchronously from the file system. Uh, the, bled, the thread wouldn't necessarily then be blocked and uh, you could potentially load multiple files um, at once and there's, there's other, there's, there's advantages to that. Um, along with it, there's um, in node 14 and node 16, but not in node 12, there's top level await, uh, abbreviated TLA. So in a node 14 or node 16 ESM module, you can do await, let's say await foo. Um, and because the modules are loaded asynchronously, this means that you can do some asynchronous initialization in, in, your, in your module if, if you need to. Um, unlike uh, CommonJS, um, which is essentially just returning an object uh, that you create, um, the, uh, the, the modules that you can, as when you import them, are immutable, they're read only. Um, so they can't, they can't be manipulated. Um, kind of an advantage, I think, over CJS. Um, there's, um, instead of the invisible function wrap wrapper that you have with common JS, where it's essentially just uh, in, in, in a common JS situation, uh, you say have const foo equals require bar. Uh, if this was a common JS module, what would actually be happening, what Node actually does behind the scenes, is wrap it like this in a function. And then I'm not sure exactly what order the arguments are, but it's something like mod, module exports require file name, data name. This is off the top of my head, so I'm not, I'm not sure exactly on the order of that, but essentially that's how a, a, a node common JS module works. It's, it's wrapped and then, um, and then uh, the, the arguments are passed in from uh, the node initialization stuff. Um, and so when you modify module exports, for instance, um, that is the thing that's then taken and returned. Um, so that's kind of how common JS works, but uh, ESM is an entirely new specified module scope. Um, it behaves differently. It behaves more as if uh, with a function you had the use strict pragma 
There are some minor differences, but essentially it will be in use strict mode, which means that you can't use things like with and eval works a little differently and uh, other things along those lines. Um, the uh, import statements are statically passed and then, uh, and then loaded based on that passing. Um, there is also a dynamic import function, uh, which is why top level await can be quite useful. Uh, if I, for whatever reason, needed to do a dynamic import, I can say uh, await import, right? Um, uh, the exporting uh, in ESM is syntax based instead of modifying uh, an object. So export const meow equals cat, for instance, or you also have the export default, say export function, right? Um, so you have this, this slightly different thing with the default export, which is its own special thing, uh, which would sort of be the equivalent of what module exports is, but then you have these, these you can do named exports as well, um, uh, which, which is kind of similar to how you'd have an object with properties on, but it's, it's, it's classified slightly differently. Um, very crucial here, um, CommonJS has require.cache and uh, that, that you can sort of mess around with a little bit. Um, uh, which, which holds a cache of all of the loaded modules. Um, the ESM uh, does not expose a module cache uh, that, so you can't uh, inject anything into it. You can't read anything from it. It's, it's black boxed. Um, ESM modules can load both CommonJS and ECMAScript modules. So in terms of the ecosystem, um, the ecosystem is very CommonJS heavy, um, and CommonJS can't load ESM. So that is a definitely a friction point. Um, so before you move to ESM, uh, do like if you were to publish a, a module for consumption, do do consider that um, a lot of uh, deployed projects are still just written in CommonJS. Um, one other thing that's not on here on this slide is that. Um, um, there's no way for Node to know just by passing the content whether a module dependency uh, file uh, is CommonJS or ESM. It has to assume that either by the file extension, which for if it's .js or .cjs by default, it's CommonJS, or if it's .mjs, it's ESM. Um, or by a type field on the package JSON that sets the type to module, in which case um, .js files will be interpreted as ECMAScript modules. It's complicated, um, no doubt about that. So I wanted to see uh, if I could build some stuff with ESM, see where the pain points were. And the first problem I hit uh, was that Testing it is very difficult at the minute um, because, primarily because uh, um, if you can't manipulate the, um, uh, the cache, then uh, you can't override dependencies, which means you can't mock dependencies. So I went about finding a different way to do that for, for ESM. But before we talk about that, <laughs> um, I want to kind of contextualize um, uh, my approach and, and why I've taken the approach that I've taken um, and the things that I, that I feel are important um, with a testing strategy. So to be clear, we're talking about unit testing here. Um, for me, uh, and, and we can get into semantics, but for me, um, you have to think about what, what the unit is. Particularly in other languages, the unit can, can actually be a, a file in the lib folder or something like that. For me, the unit 
is the API boundaries of a thing that you're building. Um, if you're building a large monolith, it's something different. So um, if you're building a, a small module that's to be consumed, then my perspective is that you should write tests that test the module from the outside and not try and test any of the module internals. Just make sure you hit those internals uh, on your test coverage. And if you can't find a way to hit those internals, uh, that, that any internal logic, then remove that logic because there's not a way for it to, to, to be reached. Um, a microservice, I think, uh, should be defined as the unit, in which case you test the edges of that service. So if it's uh, HTTP-based, say RESTful, then you, you hit endpoints end of, that, of that service. Um, some people at that point might be saying, well, those are integration tests. Call it whatever you want. This is, this is the, the testing strategy that I use for whatever I'm building. Um, if I'm building a, a front-end application and I'm dealing with, say, a React component, then in that case, the React component is actually the unit. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're working on and, and you know, the, the methodology. If it's a monolith, like a, like a React application, or a, a small library or a small service, those are, those are different things. So I don't want to uh, test internals. Um, I want to test the edges um, via the exposed interfaces. Uh, I don't want to mock any internals because you just end up in a situation where uh, if you start mocking internals, um, a lot of the time it's just a very elaborate way to test whether true is true. Um, and those aren't really tests. Um, but dependencies, I'm all for mocking in, you know, lim some, there's always exceptions, but um, if, you, if you want a dependency to uh, behave in a certain way and you don't want to um, figure out how to uh, make that happen uh, with uh, uh, an integration in, in environment and, and databases and sending up everything, um, all of which is reliable once you start working uh, across the network and that makes your tests inherently unreliable, um, then, then make the, the library that you're using that, that integrates with those things uh, behave how you want it to behave for that test scenario by mocking it. Um, this is black box, black box testing. And um, as I say, um, name it as you wish. Uh, let's talk about... Uh, test libraries and test frameworks, what I'm calling test libraries and test frameworks. There's really two kinds. There's ones where you have uh, implicit globals. So like Mocha and Jest, they, they, uh, Mocha has like, by you know, usually uh, it has a describe and it uh, functions and some other stuff. Uh, Jest has an implicit test function. Um, those, those I would call frameworks. Um, uh, but a test, uh, uh, Oh, also, what I would call frameworks are um, a frame, uh, a test code that needs a test runner, e.g. Uh, a separate CLI uh, tool that runs that test code. And the reason it needs that runner is because you have things like these implicit globals and, and possibly other implicit behavior. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a test framework in, as, I, as I define it. Um, a test library is something that can run independently. Um, it, it doesn't have implicit globals. You have to import or require uh, any, any of the uh, API surface of that test library that you use. And it should be able to be executed directly with Node, although a test runner isn't like out of the question. You can still have a test runner for it, but it's not... Uh, uh, required. It, it can it can be uh, used directly with Node, or it can be used with a test runner. So an example of of uh, test libraries would be uh, Tap and Tape. I prefer test libraries over test frameworks personally, um, because of if you don't have implicit globals, you don't have the magic. I think less magic is a good thing. Um, Anytime you have things that are implicit, there's, there's linters and other, other things that do static analysis that uh, 
you, you increase the burden on of, of knowing these things and syntax highlighting and editors and stuff, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it, 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 it just it just for me uh, places an unnecessary burden on other parts of the ecosystem. Um, the other thing is when you're trying to debug, like if you're writing tests, it's because you're trying to uh, apply rigor to your code. And sometimes that can expose uh, problems that you come across while you're writing your tests. So um, being able to debug is, is quite important. Um, debugging uh, um, through the test runners of test frameworks and the implicit logic and the wrapping that they do, um, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but it, it does in increase the complexity of a debugging exercise. Um, if you can run things directly with Node, you know exactly what flags are applied. You know, um, uh, you know uh, exactly um, what code is being executed uh, from initialization onwards. Um, for me, it simplifies uh, that process. Um, putting putting um, uh, individual uh, I mean, the, the way that I write, write tests is I, I, I break it up by file oftentimes. So uh, a test directory may have, you know, five, six, seven, eight, however many files, and then running NPM test will execute all of the tests in all of those files. But if one test in one file breaks, I don't want to run all of the tests again. So if you have a test runner, what you can do is you can install it globally, and then you can use that to, um, uh, to run your tests. And that's fine, and you can isolate, and you can use that to run just one one file. And you, granted, you can do that, but when you're switching node versions, uh, now you've got a new problem. You've got to reinstall your test runner, or you've got to import it over from another uh, uh, where it's installed elsewhere. If you're using NVM, for instance, I mean, it gets it gets complicated no matter what. Um, if you can just run it directly with Node, the, it, there's it's fine. You just you just run it directly with Node. Uh, so, so, so you can just like isolate that that one file with the failing test, just run it straight. Um, it's um, it's good to isolate your problem in tests, is what I'm saying, and it's good to do that in the least uh, uh, noisy and least overheady way. Okay, cool. So let's talk about mocking dependencies. So in, in CommonJS, uh, no matter what library you use, there's manipulation of, of require.cache going on. Um, Proxyquire is uh, a very popular uh, mocking library um, uh, for um, uh, mocking things. I think Jest has its own mocking uh, thing as part of it. Um, but generally, the concept is that you supply stubs, what I'm calling the mocks object here, and um, you use uh, uh, you, you you specify uh, essentially the requ requirable namespace, whether that's a native module like FS or an ecosystem module like Open, or a path to a specific file in your project. Um, you you set them up and you 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 supply the things that you actually uh, want to override and, and you implement that uh, behavior that you want. Uh, and then you just uh, uh, pass the the file that you actually want to test, uh, say say the the entry point uh, for your module or the path to your React component, I suppose, uh, if you're doing sort of server side testing of React components, uh, and you you uh, and then and then that will be loaded. But as as it's loaded, the um, the dependencies that that it's looking for uh, will uh, Use the, the the mocks that you've defined if if there's dependencies that correspond with mocks that you've defined, right? Um, and it and it does that by basically overriding require cache because require cache uh, is is checked by require before it's going to load a file. So say your say your uh, your path to file being tested dot js file loads the dot forward slash path four slash two four slash file dot js uh, file as a dependency um, if you override that namespace in require cache it's just gonna 
uh, the require function is just going to require whatever uh, is going to return. Sorry, whatever in require cache. So, as I mentioned, um, the ESM uh, loading algorithm uh, does not expose uh, uh, so, some any equivalent to require cache. It's also more complicated the the way that the dependency trees are are loaded. So. Um, a require cache wouldn't even work. It would have to be something more uh, substantial uh, to expose. Uh, I still think we could really do with something like that in Node, um, but um, I think we're uh, some way off from that and not sure if it will actually happen. Um, just, to, just to be clear, we're not talking about code, uh, ESM module-like code that transpiles down to CGS. We're talking about native ESM, not transpile code. Um, so there is a way, um, and it's with uh, the loader's API. Um, if I click this link, we can see uh, the description of loaders, but we can also see that the stability is experimental. Um, while ECMAScript modules themselves uh, are um, not experimental anymore, the loader API is still experimental. Um, so, you know, caveat mTOR, as it were. Um, the if you if you if you want to use ECMAScript modules, and you want to test those ECMAScript modules then you have to use this experimental loader API if you're into mocking dependencies, basically. Um, so an ESM loader is specified by passing a loader flag uh, to the node binary. Uh, you can only specify one loader. So if you have two reasons that you need loaders, uh, now you've got to figure out a way to specify to solve both of those reasons with one loader. Um, this is why the API is experimental. Um, I'm hoping that uh, um, there will be efforts to allow for multiple loaders in future. Um, it, it's likely to change as well. So um, whatever I'm discussing here could break uh, soon uh, or it, it could last. Um, We'll see. Uh, that's the nature of experimental APIs. This is the only way that, well, it's the only way that I can think of and after talking to uh, various uh, people involved in the Node project, I'm pretty sure it's the only way you can modify the ESM module loading. Uh, so what we can do then is we can use a loader to modify uh, the loading algorithm um, of uh, ESM uh, of of the ESM module system, um, uh, and then somehow uh, have some sort of API uh, that allows us to 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 provide mocks for our tests. But that means that every time, if you want to run your test directly with Node. Every time you do that, you're going to have to specify the loader flag, um, which you know is not ideal. It's I know it's, you know who cares about a few few more typing a few more things, but it's really about the cognitive overhead and having to remember to type out this fairly lengthy thing every time. Dash dash loader equals whatever the thing is I am loading. So what you could do is you could wrap a CLI around Node um, with uh, that then. Uh, uses child process to spawn uh, with that loader flag preset. Um, but now you're back to uh, test runners. Um, and uh, I'm trying to avoid this scenario where I have a test framework. I personally want to keep this idea of having a test library. Um, there's also uh, worker threads. So worker threads is the ability to, uh, it's a, it's a another fairly new node API um, where you can spawn another uh, instance of 
of the of a JavaScript environment with with Node around it. It is slightly different to the the main thread of Node, but it's 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 pretty much good enough. Uh, we'll talk about more that that the the discrepancies later. Um, and when you spawn a worker thread, um, which again it, it's a thread, it's not a process, but you can still set the loader flag when you create the worker thread. Bear that in mind, we're gonna come back to it. So with all of that information that I've laid before you, uh, now I'm gonna talk about um, my attempts. Uh, and my, you know, they, they work. Um, uh, to, to, to have some way of, of, uh, of mocking. Uh, ESM dependencies. So the first one uh, is called Lazaretto. Um, Lazaretto uh, was built for a slightly different purpose, but it was part of my my personal journey into into figuring out uh, you know how to make this work. Uh, I. Uh, Side topic, I'm the um, uh, technical uh, lead and primary author of uh, the OpenJS uh, certifications. One Node.js application developer and the other Node.js services developer. Um, I'm also the author of the training courses for the certification. And also there's, a, if you look at point 2C there, um, there's a free course that you can also take. Um, you can also get certified in that free course, uh, um, but you have to, have to pay for that. But you can take the free course uh, to, to get acquainted uh, with Node.js in general. Um, and then uh, there's two other courses that talk about specializing in uh, services development, which is uh, uh, you know, building Node services and, and HTTP and, t and, uh, and security and then node application development, which is um, pretty much everything else. Uh, so uh, I've told you all of that because I had to build Lazaretto when we upgraded the, uh, um, uh, the, the examination environment, uh, I think it was last October, uh, so that we could support ECMAScript modules. If, if candidates now want to use ECMAScript modules in their answers, they can. Um, because because those, the ECMAScript modules were, were made official and they were no longer experimental, um, we need to be able to support them. So um, because the, the exams are actually automatically uh, graded, I needed to be able to load uh, a candidate's answer that may be CGS or maybe ESM and then sometimes mock dependencies. Um, so that's, that's, that was the, the primary purpose of Lazaretto. So the way it works is it, uh, it accepts a mock, a mock subject uh, similar to the one that, that proxy require uh, takes, uh, I've gone through. Um, uh, you, you, you pass it a, an entry point and then um, it uh, loads a worker thread with the loader flag. Um, because it runs uh, in a new thread, what it initially does is uh, it has to take the, those uh, uh, mock uh, uh, the, the functions on the mock object, um, which actually the, the functions on the mock object is slightly different to the proxy require mock object because it takes uh, each each mocked namespace is assigned to a function and then that function returns the actual mock. But those functions get, get stringified basically and included in the worker thread and evaluated uh, as, part of, uh, as part of that. This isn't ideal because it means you lose uh, access to the closure scope. Um, but what this, is, what this is good for uh, is that because it's running in a worker thread and because you can pass messages between the main thread and the worker thread, um, it allowed, allowed me to do some white box uh, uh, sort of testing strategy as well. So I can, um, within the closure scope of the candidates executed code, I can also uh, run expressions and, and check for things. Um, 
yeah, uh, let's let's take a quick look at the API of that because that that's a lot to take in. Um, so yeah, so we say we have a, a mock object like this. Um, we have a function, and then that function can be async, an async function, and then it returns the actual the actual mock. Uh, we pass in, uh, we get a sandbox uh, by awaiting a Lazaretto, pass in our stuff. Um, the sandbox as well can, where are you? Uh, actually uh, call and evaluate code within the worker thread context as well. Um, so take a look at that. It's interesting. It's more, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend uh, 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 using this um, uh, I wouldn't recommend using using this other than what I use it for right now, uh, or ever, um, because it is it is very specific to the use case, um, but it's part of 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 that work uh, or, or of getting to getting to that place. Um, so, Lazaretto, the way I built it, uh, it can mock both CGS and ESM modules because. You know that someone could be implementing using ESM, but then consuming CGS modules. Um, it can be direct, directly executed with Node. No test running required. Um, the there's a context object uh, that that's used to pass state between the main thread and the uh, the worker thread, uh, and that's a way I can uh, um, receive state back and, uh, that I can assert against in the main thread. Um, but it's limited by the uh, by the the, al the cloning algorithm that that uh, the, the the worker thread API uh, relies on, um, which which yeah, uh, there's things that just won't won't clone. Um, yeah, the white box testing, cool. Okay, so that was the first pass. Then I started um, building a, a CLI tool, and I wanted to try and build it in ESM. And so I wrote Mockalicious uh, to do that. And I wanted this to work differently. I didn't want to have to uh, uh, have code that gets uh, evaluated and then inject uh, code mocks that have to have stringified functions that then gets all concatenated together and then run in a really esoteric way. Um, I wanted to see if I could improve on the approach. So, um, unlike Lazaretto, which is, is, is it's for a very specific use case, Mockalicious is more for a generic use case, just, you know, the general unit testing uh, uh, approach that I've described already. So, um, it doesn't need to... Uh, uh, evaluate code in a separate thread to the actual test code. It can still use a worker thread um, in certain scenarios, which I'll explain in a second. But um, it doesn't. It the the actual tests uh, that are running also run in the worker thread, which solves the how do we get a, a mocked thing from one thread into the other. Um, it can also be used for both ESM and CGS um, at, from an ESM or CGS parent. Um, and uh, Lazaretto tends to be uh, fit for purpose uh, for what it's doing. But um, when you get into sort of more uh, uh, in-depth implementations, you can get into situations where um, uh, the, the dependencies uh, are sort of fork out uh, with with ESM. Um, long story short, Mockalicious had to also introduce cache busting um, to make sure that um, that uh, a file that's loaded uh, doesn't start start blocking our um, dependencies. If if the if the file's loaded before our um, our mock our mock is 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 inserted. Um, there's no way to to uh, to mock it anymore. So Mockalicious solves for that edge case as well. Um, by cache busting, I mean if you've ever worked in the browser uh, and uh, you couldn't get a, a, a script to load, 
uh, differently, uh, or that sorry, you couldn't get a, a script, the, the latest version of a script load. Uh, you'd stick a question mark for the query string parameter, and you'd uh, uh, you know put some random hash on there or something, and then you were always getting that that latest script and. We essentially have to use the same approach in Mockalicious because it's dealing with file URLs uh, rather than just paths. And so because they're file URLs, we can jam that uh, query string on the end. It's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird stuff <laughs> in, in all of this. Um, so this is what using Mockalicious would look like, which is fairly similar to the, the proxy choir uh, uh, thing. Um, we just uh, pass in the, the entry point file, that's the path to file being tested, and then we pass it our mocks object. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, pretty, pretty much the same. Um, proxy choir current uh, has a, proxy choir has a, a, a um, sort of like a, a fall through mechanism by default where it uses the underlying module. Mockalicious doesn't have that currently, so you have to kind of do that part yourself. Um, but uh, it's, it's geared towards mocking um, ESM as well. So this, this default uh, property is the uh, uh, maps to the, ex the default export. Uh, if you don't provide that in an object and you just have say a function like in this case, then that becomes the default export. It, does, it, do it, it, it doesn't violate any expectations basically. It just does what you think it's gonna do. Um, so Mockalicious, uh, has uh, an auto load mode and a load uh, manual load mode. <laughs> First time I said that out loud, I didn't realize what a sort of um, weird thing that is to say. Uh, so if we go with the, the normal loaded mode, uh, you can just specify the loader flag. So dash dash loader equals mockalicious forward slash loader dot mjs, and then whatever it is that you're running. So Maybe test.js would be better than app.js there. If the loader flag is omitted though, what Mockalicious does um, is it starts a worker thread automatically with the loader flag preset on that worker thread. And then crucially, it blocks the main thread. So if you initialize Mockalicious at the top of some tests before you run any of the tests, um, the main thread will just halt right there. If you haven't used the loader flag, it will, just, it will just halt. And then all of the tests will be reloaded in the worker thread. The, the worker thread will then uh, have the loader flag set in such a way that the loader um, can replace uh, um, dependencies with the mocks specified in each test. And because, uh, um, and, and that just happens in sort of like some sort of piece of global state. Um, but the worker thread part uh, is really just about making that, that, uh, that loader uh, um, uh, automatically present. And again, that, that's about just being able to run a file with Node. It's a ridiculous amount of, I acknowledge it's a ridiculous amount of effort to go to, to just run a file with Node, but it, it's just a really important thing to me <laughs> for some reason. Um, so it, just, to, just to sort of talk through that. So the way that it works is uh, we set up a loader, call Mockalicious, and pass in uh, import meta URL, which in, is the same as underscore underscore file name, basically, uh, in CJS. It's just referring to uh, itself. So if our test file was like, you know, dot forward slash test forward slash index dot test dot JS, then um, import meta URL would be the, the full absolute path to that file being executed. So that tells Mockalicious, load this file. Um, if the load, if, if when this, this code here was executed, if it was executed without the loader flag, Mockalicious detects that there's no loader flag set, and then it will um, uh, execute the, uh, the same file in a worker thread with the loader flag set, and it will block at this point in the main thread. Then in the worker thread, it will run this test, uh, output the results and so on and so forth, and then when the worker thread exits, this will 
force exit from the process. So this test will never run in the main thread. Um, and that's, that was one of the key parts of Mockalicious. Uh, however, some things don't work in worker threads. It was good enough for me and my use cases and I knew how to dance around some of these pieces. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it, 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 worker threads don't support process chdir, for instance. So if you do a process.chdir in your test, uh, it's gonna break in the worker thread and it will break explicitly and give you advice on what to do. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there's some other stuff like that. Now, Mockalicious also does a bunch of stuff where it uh, uh, sort of patches some of these things. Um, for instance, um, uh, well, I'll show you. So if we're on the, in the Mockalicious repo, um, uh, in, uh, for instance, in uh, worker threads, there's these methods on process.stdout that aren't present, so it recreates them. Uh, there's other stuff that it recreates as well all, all around this area. Um, it, it recreates process.std in as well in, in a way that's compatible with our implementation. Let's not get too much into the, into the weeds on that though. Um, so if, 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 you are, if you are doing any of those things that cause issues, then you have to just go back to using the, the, the loader flag. Um, but it will work. So the auto load mode is, is tentative uh, at best, let's say. Um, but if you have to specify the loader flag, it's kind of a, uh, I don't know, I just, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like having to do that. So then I wrote a thing called tapx, which is just a thin wrapper around tap, uh, no tap. Uh, and, and it basically, um, makes developing uh, with ESM, uh, or writing tests for ESM, I should say, easy. Um, it, 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 it pulls in Mockalicious itself and, and exposes it uh, from, from, uh, from TAPX, um, and uh, the test runner uh, for TAP is also wrapped by TAPX in a way where it just adds the loader flag for you. So um, you can just uh, run uh, you know, TAP test and it will work as a runner. Uh, this is, this is like, you know, a scenario I've created where it's like, you know, 90% good enough. Uh, and if I get myself into a situation where I can't run the thing with node anymore, then I either change that situation or I just go, right, I'll just run it with tap. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, ESM modules, and this is another thing, if you start using ESM and you have to test them, um, they're currently incompatible with NYC, which is a thing built on top of Istanbul. You might be familiar with Istanbul, which is the code coverage reporter. Luckily, um, V8, and I'm sure they'll fix that at some point, but luckily V8 has something uh, now uh, that's, um, that, where it has its own code coverage instrumentation um, in the actual JavaScript engine. V8 is the JavaScript engine that Node uses. Um, there's, an, there's a coverage reporter called C8, um, that that uh, can create reports based on V8 instrumentation, instrumentation output. Um, so TAPX also replaces that coverage reporter so you can do proper coverage reporting with ESM. Um, doesn't work in Node 12 though because the coverage stuff is too buggy. Woo, so that leads me to this question. Is ESM ready? I don't think so. You've seen how much I've had to do um, to, to, to just to make the testing work. And yes, okay, maybe I had a couple of um, pretty um, uh, <laughs> pretty strict red lines, um, uh, but those things are important to my workflow, um, and I I stand I stand by the effort. Um, but it's still very rough, and it's and as I say, you know, my, the methods I've used to, to try and make it work, they're good enough for me. Are they good enough for everyone? I don't, I don't know. Um, I think I think Mockalicious could, with you know, we're about eighty percent there with Mockalicious. 
and another 20% to go, but it's going to take like, you know, 80% more effort on top to get that final 20% piece to make Mokalicious actually uh, work for everyone easily. Um, well, at least, at least if, uh, at least in terms of running the file directly with Node. Um, the other problem is I talked about debugability of running a file, uh, a test file directly with Node. Totally true, uh, but with Mokalicious, because it's going through, uh, it's using the web, uh, the worker thread approach. Uh, it's not very easy to debug worker threads right now, so got to wait for that to catch up as well. Um, loader APIs are experimental. Uh, so, you know, all of this work to get the testing to work could, could also be wasted or it will may need some serious updating or maybe it'll be okay. Um, but in, until that's stable, you, you really, you, you're really limited on the use cases. I mean, putting a, a, some ESM code into production uh, uh, without having any way to instrument other than via an experimental API means that uh, things like APMs, like New Relic and so forth, they're going to struggle to support that because the primitives aren't there to support it and the ones that are, are experimental. So um, there's, there's a lot more that needs to happen yet, I think. Uh, current tooling, uh, code editors, linters, test frameworks, build tooling, um, there's that whole issue of, of faux ESM and a lot of that tooling is is based around um, around the way that transpiled ECMAScript modules works, and not around how native ESM works. So that all has to catch up. And also, how do you differentiate? Um, ESM modules also break compatibility with CJS um, because CJS can't load ESM in the init phase, and uh, that's going to start to cause, is already causing and will cause a lot more ecosystem friction. Um, there's a thing called conditional exports. Uh, you can find this in the node docs. I would say uh, uh, look look that up because um, you, can, you can use that to provide support for both ESM and CGS. So I would say if you're, if you're going to create ESM modules um, that you want to be consumed, that you want people to be able to consume, uh, then um, uh, either make them CGS or, or make them both CGS and ESM and, and check out conditional exports in the docs on how to do that. Um, so my conclusion is I don't think that ESM is, is ready for most cases. The one case I've used it for is building a CLI, uh, a, C, a little CLI tool, uh, because I'm not so worried about application performance monitoring and I solved the testing part. Um, in terms of when ESM will be ready, unclear. Timeline is unclear to me. Um, I would say, um, uh, at very least, we, we need to have uh, the Loaders API uh, as being uh, as stable, and then you need to have uh, every everyone's uh, implementations on top of that. By everyone, I mean the APMs mostly. Okay, um, here's some things we discussed and some links. Um, I hope this was valuable to you. I know it was quite uh, intense in places. Um, I'll be in the, the chat whenever I'm going to be in the chat uh, to, to help answer questions and stuff. Um, I would love to have gone deeper, but I'm really just trying to give you a broad overview um, um, such as it is. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Thanks. <laughs>